Hello and welcome to History 391. This week, or at least for the first two you know, class meetings of the week, we were going to look at um, a Viet Cong memoir by Trong Nu Tang. Um, this man, Tang, was a very interesting figure, um, as you'll see as you're reading through it. Um, effectively, as you can see, it's an inside account of the Vietnam War and its aftermath. And the big reason I picked this text and I wanted to talk about it is it's written by a Vietnamese person. We've kind of crept in the last couple of weeks and talked about the American perspective quite a lot. Um, and that's partly by design. It's actually a big part of what this class is, is kind of a big idea behind the class is looking at how do we think about Vietnam in the American experience? To what extent did an American experience take the war in Vietnam and make it all about America, which isn't something unique to America or even necessarily bad. I think it's kind of a normal human thing to do. And so rather than try and kind of counter that or compete with it specifically, I, I just wanted to acknowledge it and kind of think about it and talk about it. So as you'll notice in the lecture material in these weeks, we're kind of bouncing back and forth a little bit in between kind of American perspectives and, and reactions in American culture and then kind of Vietnamese perspectives. So this week we'll talk about, um, you know, Tang's writing for a couple of classes or, you know, as part of your work this week. And then later in the week, um, or well, however your workflow is working, um, I have a short video piece later on in the week talking about um, you know, what's happening in Vietnam after reunification. And then we'll return to counterculture next week um, and then get into Robert McNamara, who had worked for President Kennedy and then President Johnson and kind of talk about this kind of American revisionism or American experience of Vietnam. So let's come back to Tang now and talk about Tang for a few minutes. Um, my advice to you for, um, for your work on this book this week is to really kind of be thinking about um, how this source contextualizes our understanding of uh, Vietnam, the Vietnam War and the Vietnamese experience in the 20th century and the Vietnamese move towards um, you know, independence and creating their own nation. Um, and to be willing to do what historians do, which is really kind of, uh, you know, tackle the source and really kind of get stuck into it and take what you need out of it um, and kind of go from there. So, well, what do I mean by that? Well, for me, looking at it for Monday, for the first day of uh, class this week, I had asked you guys it's in the syllabus to read chapters one, two, three, seven, eight and nine. Um, and the reason I picked those ones, firstly, I wanted to cut down on your reading a little bit. Um, I know you have other classes and, and I'm trying to kind of help you target into certain kinds of ideas. And for me, chapters one, two and three kind of work together as a set and chapters seven, eight and nine kind of work together as a set as well. Um, and my main encouragement to you would be to go through each of these six chapters and write out specific bullet points for each of the chapters. That's exactly what I've done in my own notes. So each chapter has kind of my, my big takeaway that I think is useful or important and then a kind of a series of bullet points underneath it that I think are that are meaningful and interesting. And I would also strongly encourage you if you're not in the habit of doing it to include page numbers in these notes as well which is a huge deal when it comes to writing papers um, and is a nice little detail to throw in there for a final exam if necessary. So I wanted to just in a very you know very briefly in this brief video talk you through um, two chapters and kind of how I looked at the chapters. Now I'm going to give you the very brief overview um, of why I found each particular chapter each of these two chapters to be particularly interesting and the kind of the way that I was choosing to approach them. This isn't meant to be exhaustive um, partly so that if you choose to do chapter two for example which I'm about to talk about uh, you'll still have your own stuff to kind of say um, but hopefully I can model a little bit you know how I'm kind of going through things and we'll see how it goes to the next video. So um, I'm choosing to talk about two of the chapters that were assigned, chapters two and chapter seven. Sorry, chapters two and seven. Um, chapter two is uh, An Afternoon with Uncle Ho and chapter seven is The Birth of the NLF. So chapter two first, An Afternoon with Uncle Ho. Um, this is an extremely interesting chapter um, and I think for a number of reasons. I wanted to talk about it for a number of reasons. One, I think it shows us uh, the real value of primary source material and how interesting it can be because you've been hearing about Hull through me. We've, we've had access to one or two sources written by him back when he was known as Enyai Kwok, um, you know, the man who loves his nation. Um, and we've seen him referred to a lot, especially in American sources. Here we're getting a very, very different perspective. We're getting this perspective from this young Vietnamese student who actually a young Vietnamese student of privilege, a young Vietnamese student uh, who really kind of has the world at his feet, especially if he's willing to, to accept kind of the French role in that kind of prosperity, which he very much is before he meets uh, the man he comes to know as Uncle Ho. And Ho Chi Minh insists that he call him Uncle Ho, uh, back Ho, call me Uncle Ho. Um, 
And our author comes away from this experience extremely moved uh, by these discussions of Ho Chi Minh. So it's quite interesting to me because I think what you're seeing is, one, we're getting kind of um, a fuller picture of Ho Chi Minh um, in the sense that I have said a bunch of times in class and we have readings that have said it, he was very good at motivating people, he was a very good organiser, he's a very good political organiser, a very convincing person, very skillful political organiser and, and skillful ideological kind of, you know, operator. But here we see evidence, at least according to Tang, of this is exactly how it works. And this is kind of almost like a conversion experience. So the chapter's really interesting as well, you see, because it comes in between chapters one and chapter three. Chapter one is his childhood. He grew up with a decent amount of money and a very kind of a quote unquote conservative, traditional kind of Vietnamese viewpoint, which has values, you know, the, the language of Confucianism, the language of Vietnamese conservatism, the language of pride in your country. These are languages that Ho Chi Minh can speak, but Ho Chi Minh is bringing in elements that weren't there in, for us, chapter one, or for this man, the first, you know, 18 to 19 years of his life. They just weren't there. And Ho Chi Minh brings in this kind of new element to it. And then in chapter three, he talks a lot about, you know, his personal liberation. And you'll see this a lot in primary sources from people in the early 20th century in particular who get involved in these revolutionary movements. This is across the world, not just in Vietnam. And and, and you'll see it even at the national level where, where intellectuals and policymakers talk about what they're trying to do with their countries. The Chinese and the Japanese did this a lot, talking about personal liberation or Awakening is a very popular metaphor, very common metaphor. And so I think chapter two is really interesting because it's sandwiched in between these two chapters. It's clearly linked to both. And it's showing us that, you know, how skillful Ho could be and how Ho is generating, you know, he's generating something real in the mind and heart of this young man. And I, I that that's really useful. Now, there's two caveats I'd like to point out. One, it is a primary source. We don't have to trust primary sources. And we don't, and, and not, not because Tang is lying necessarily, but because, you know, he's writing many decades later. Um, he is going to give certain kinds of perspectives. He has very specific kinds of uh, goals and when, when he's writing that, um, that some of them are evident, some of them are not evident, some of them he's actively working towards consciously, and some of them are just kind of there in his subconscious while he's writing. And these are all things we have to be aware of. The other thing I would say to you is wait till you get to later in the book. Um, as you read further in the book and read further into the chapters of the book, you'll see that uh, one of the things that makes it such a valuable memoir is that Tang really kind of goes through all the different experiences he had uh, throughout his lifetime, and he starts to contextualize these things later. So that, but that, but but that's where I would feel chapter two is really useful. The other chapter I'll talk about briefly is chapter seven, where he talks about the birth of the NLF, the National Liberation Front. Now we already know in class that the NLF was ostensibly a coalition movement that was basically led by communists um, and became known, um, often not very happily, by members of the NLF themselves as the Viet Cong by the Americans and certain elements of the South Vietnamese government. Well, Tang is not a communist, uh, or at least certainly was not a communist at this particular point in his life. Um, and he is actually, so he's, he, this is testimony from a non-communist NLF figure. And that's important. Uh, um, and that's interesting. And that gives us a layer of texture that is important for us to understand. Because although I've kind of been... I, I do think it's accurate to say the NLF was dominated by communists and that the Southern Revolutionary Movement was largely being driven by communists. That's not to say that every single NLF member was a communist. And in fact, it's difficult for me in a class lecture or anything else to kind of explain to you the complexities of how these different constituencies, constituencies interact with each other. Well, Tang here can, can tell us because he's from a constituency that isn't a communist one. And so as I'm reading through chapter seven, a couple of things really kind of strike me. Um, and I think one of the, the, the main ones really is that he kind of, he clarifies that DM's problem is not that he didn't have achievements, he did have achievements, but his achievements never really felt positive to Tang and to many other Vietnamese. They really felt like achievements that were making DM stronger. They weren't making Vietnam stronger. And so that was a real problem. And the other thing is that Tang is at pains in this chapter to really clarify, and this is where eight and nine, I think, build on this further, that the NLF was a genuine thing, that it was not a puppet for Vietnamese communism, that it wanted a democratic and independent Vietnam. And as the chapters that come after kind of show, America, sadly from the American perspective, becomes seen as an obstacle to this and an enemy to this. But certainly the, you know, this idea of a revolution in South Vietnam needs to be understood as something organic and natural that is happening. It's one of the challenges we've had talking in this class, one of the challenges the Americans had was that they desperately wanted a democratic, viable, independent state in the south of Vietnam, but they ended up backing these rulers who just were not that. 
at least from Tang's perspective, at least at the time of his life that he's writing, he certainly saw the NLF as that. And, and notice that he, uh, not just in chapter 7, but in chapters 8 and 9 as well, he's making subtle distinctions between being South Vietnamese and North Vietnamese. Now, that doesn't mean that he believes that South Vietnam should be its own country separate from the North. In fact, quite the opposite. He's very clear in stating he wants a united Vietnam. However, negotiation will have to happen for that to come about. He's, he recognises that the government in North Vietnam is different from the government in South Vietnam. And this is despite, as we saw earlier in chapter three, or sorry, chapter two, his own personal admiration for Ho Chi Minh. So that's how I would kind of go into those, that, that's, that's an example of how to go into each of those two chapters. So I would encourage you to, to do something along those lines for every single one of the six chapters that were assigned for today and do it again for the readings for Wednesday. And, and you know, to, to reach your own conclusions, if you have a different reaction to two, chapter two, you should go with what your reaction is. That's the important thing about accessing these sources. Obviously, I'm here, I'm here on Zoom at the moment, virtually to talk to you, but uh, ordinarily I'm in my office, I'm in classrooms, and we can have these conversations and we can discuss why we had different takes and I can kind of talk you through, you know, my, my perception of that particular issue. But, you know, the key thing here really is to become more confident reading these sources and to develop your own opinions and your own ideas. That's really, that's really a key thing here. So along these lines, for the discussion question, please pick a single chapter um, and discuss how it contextualizes or complicates um, a single dynamic we've been discussing in class over the semester so far. Thanks for watching.